five must-see moments from day one of Judge Jackson's SCOTUS confirmation hearings. Monday marked the first day of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson's Supreme Court confirmation hearings. Sen. Cory Booker was excited about an African-American woman potentially serving on the Supreme Court. Today to me is a day of joy. I cannot tell you how happy I am. Today we should rejoice because President Biden nominated someone that we've heard to be the 116th associate judge of the Supreme Court who is extraordinarily talented. Sen. Sheldon Whitehouse said Judge Jackson is extremely qualified for the position and her nomination was not a result of dark money. We are holding a hearing for an accomplished, experienced, highly qualified nominee to the Supreme Court who came to us not through a dark money funded turnstile, but through a fair and honest selection process. But Republican senators pointed out the issues surrounding Jackson's nomination, according to Sen. Lindsey Graham, the left is hypocritical when it comes to conservative nominees that are people of color. Uh, as to the historic nature of your appointment, I understand. But when I get lectured about this from my Democratic colleagues, I remember Janice Rogers Brown, an African-American woman that was filibustered by the same people praising you. I remember, remember Miguel Estrada, one of the finest people I ever met, completely wiped out, didn't make it through the... Uh, a uh, gang of uh, 14, whatever gang I was in, I've been in so many, I can't remember. He, he didn't make the cut. Well-lived life just completely ruined. So if you're Hispanic or African-American conservative, it's about your philosophy. Sen. John Cornyn explained why he's concerned about Jackson's political advocacy. I'm a bit troubled by some of the positions you've taken and arguments that you've made representing people who... Uh, have committed terrorist acts against the United States and other dangerous criminals. As someone who has deep respect for the adversarial system of justice, I understand the importance of zealous advocacy. But it appears that sometimes this zealous advocacy has gone beyond the pale. And in some instances, it appears that your advocacy has bled over into your decision-making process as a judge. Sen. Josh Hawley laid out seven cases where the SCOT US nominee gave lenient sentences for those in possession of child pornography. At the Here are, I hope, in the next couple of days, some of the cases from your time on the, on the court, the district court, the federal district court, that I hope that we can talk about. Let me just run few, through a few of them so you know exactly which ones I mean. United States versus Hawkins. This was a child pornography case where the defendant distributed multiple images of child porn, possessed dozens more, including videos. The federal sentencing guidelines recommended a sentence of 97 to 121 months in prison. Prosecutors recommended 24 months in prison. Judge Jackson gave the defendant three months in prison. United States versus Chazen. There it's the, that case, the defendant possessed 48 files of child pornography the federal guidelines recommended 78 to 97 months in prison. The prosecutor recommended the same. Judge Jackson sentenced him to 28 months. End of the day, Judge Jackson is a radical left-wing nominee that fails to practice judicial restraint. Americans deserve answers about her philosophy and her record needs to be called into question at every turn. Proof, Biden didn't always want a black woman on the Supreme Court. This week, confirmation hearings for Judge Ket Angie Brown Jackson have started in the Senate. If confirmed, Jackson Brown will be the first black woman on the Supreme Court. Joe Biden said that seating a black woman to the highest court in the nation was a top priority. But in recent history, that just wasn't the case for Joe. In 2005, when Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor announced her retirement, then President George W. Bush's released a short list of preferred candidates to fill her seat. On his list was Judge Janice Rogers Brown. Judge Janice Rogers Brown was extremely qualified. She was Irving on the U.S. Court of Appeals in D.C. She had spent seven years as an associate justice of the California Supreme Court and was the first black woman to do so. And her history was inspiring. She rose from poverty and put herself through college and UCLA law school. But Joe Biden didn't want her to be Supreme Court justice. Nope. Despite all her qualifications and her race and gender, which Biden now thinks are paramount qualifiers for serving as a justice, Janice had one fatal flaw. She was a conservative. He went as far as telling the media that if President Bush nominated Janice Rogers Brown, I can assure you that would be a very, 
very, very difficult fight and she probably would be filibustered. At the time, this was unprecedented. In 2005, there had never been a successful filibuster of a nominee for associate justice. But back then, Joe Biden was happy to challenge history in order to prevent the first black woman from serving on the Supreme Court. Biden's nominee was asked about this blatant double standard in her own hearings on Tuesday. She claimed she'd never heard the story. Did you know that Joe Biden actively filibustered Janice Rogers Brown? I did not know that. Did you know that he told Face the Nation, if Bush nominates her for the Supreme Court, I can assure you that would be a very, very, very difficult fight and she probably would be filibustered. Is that news to you too? Yes. Okay. Now that you know that, how do you feel about it? Senator, I can't speak to something that I just learned two seconds ago in your okay, fair enough. conversation with me. Fair. Watch. Dick Durbin provides cover for Judge Ket Angie Brown Jackson's sentencing of pedophiles. One of the most contentious aspects of Judge Ket Angie Brown Jackson's judicial record comes down to how she provided lenient sentences for pedophiles particularly those that possess child pornography, on day three of the Senate Judiciary Committee hearings, Sen. Ted Cruz tried to ask Jackson why she gave a child porn offender a sentence that was 40 months below the federal sentencing guidelines. Instead of allowing Jackson to answer the question, Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Dick Durbin jumped in and said Cruz was out of time. The Stewart case, you describe that he had over 6,700 images and videos. So that's a lot, 6,700. That's a lot of kids time being sexually time. assaulted. You have taken over a minute of my time, Mr. Chairman. So, you, so You've been given extra time. You usually ask for it. You're given it. Okay, I, I know you want to interrupt. I know you don't I like this line of questions. I just want you to play by the rules. I, I know you like to interrupt, but I you've like consumed a substantial question of my uh, time of my questioning, and I'm, I'm going to ask my questions, and, and you can, if Senator, you want to testify, you're welcome to. Senator, Judge, you play by the same rules in as the every other senator. In the Stewart case... You said from the bench, thus, although this is not necessarily an, an atypical case, your child pornography possession crime was egregious in the court's view. Okay, so this is a bad one. If you're actually sentencing defendants, you said this was egregious. What did you sentence Stewart for? The guidelines said 9,721 months. Prosecutor said 97 months. You said it's egregious, 6,700 images. You come in with 57 Time months. Time has expired. Why Senators did you two sentence minutes over just the 57 months in the Stewart case? Do you want to address that? Because you're claiming it's cherry picking. In fact, you're welcome to explain any of these cases, but let's take the Stewart case. Why Coons, did you sentence him for half the amount? You're not recognized, Senator. Senator if, Coons. You don't want her to answer that question? Cruz is right. Why doesn't Durbin want Jackson to answer the question? It's not political to want judges to adequately sentence pedophiles, particularly those that prey on children. And this is an answer all Americans should want to know the answer to. Watch, Biden does a complete flop on Ukraine deterrence. On Thursday, President Joe Biden argued that the United States was never trying to deter Vladimir Putin from invading Ukraine. The RNC put together a mashup of all the times a member of the Biden administration used the word deter when talking about the war in Ukraine. You know the White House's strategic messaging shift was a flop when even NBC News gave Biden flack for the sudden pivot. Let's call this what it is, a policy flop. The Biden administration failed to prevent Putin from invading Ukraine so now they're trying to save face by saying their goal was never to deter an invasion to begin with. The record speaks for itself, Joe. Well, what's interesting, Pete, is the president just said that these sanctions and other measures they've taken were not about deterrence. And yet deterrence is a word we frequently hear from senior White House officials about the purpose of having financial constrictions on Russia. So uh, that might just be semantics, but that is certainly a notable uh, sort of idea from the president that he believes that a sustained uh, unity from European and world leaders is the best hedge against Russia to uh, to outlast Vladimir Putin.